Hi guys and welcome back to another true crime and makeup time video. If you're new here, my name is Zara and I post a new true crime video every single week. So if you love makeup and you love true crime, definitely come back for some more. And you guys have been requesting some great cases, so please continue to do so down in the comments below. And how have you guys been? I hope you guys are having a great year so far. I mean, this year is really flying by. And today's case is a super interesting one, at least it is to me. And it began as a missing persons investigation, but I think what made the case a little bit more emotional is that it took place over like the Christmas period, a time that's meant to be happy and festive and spend time with your family. So let's talk about what happened to Joanna Yates. Before we get into today's video, guys, I'm so excited to announce that we have a sponsor. Yay! Hello, hello fresh. You guys have no idea how excited I was when they reached out to me because if I thought getting one kid's dinner on the table was tough, try two kids. HelloFresh makes it so easy for me and my family to eat better as well as takes the hassle out of dinner time by delivering fresh ingredients and easy recipes right to my door. With HelloFresh, I also don't have to find the time to go to the grocery store, pack the kids up, get the groceries, scan the items, wait in the long lines. I can spend more time researching new cases, replying back to your comments, spending time with my kids while these chef crafted recipes get delivered straight to my door. I'm also really trying to get back into shape after having a baby and HelloFresh's pre-portioned ingredients and easy to follow recipe cards mean you can get a delicious home cooked dinner on the table without spending so much time meal planning or prepping dinners ahead. It's all right there in my fridge organized and Jay and I just choose what we want to eat for dinner that night. They also have so many options. So no matter your lifestyle or meal preferences, HelloFresh definitely has recipes that everyone will love. I chose their family friendly recipes, but they have calorie smart, carb smart and veggie options. So there's going to be something even the pickiest of eaters will love. My son, Carter, was good. So go to HelloFresh.com and use code ZARAV65 for 65% off plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com and use code ZARAV65 for 65% off plus free shipping. Thank you so much to HelloFresh for sponsoring today's video. And thank you so much to you guys, because without you guys, there would be no ZARAV. Okay, back to the video. So Joanna Claire Yates was born on April 9th, 1985 to her parents, David and Teresa Yates. She was born in New Hampshire, England. She received her postgraduate degree in landscape architecture from the University of Gloucestershire. And in 2008, when she was 23 years old, she met a man. His name was Greg Reardon and he was 25 years old. And he had a job in a really like well-known architectural firm. They dated for around a year before they decided to move in together in the year 2009. And they ended up settling in Bristol when Greg's company moved there. Joanna later changed her job and she ended up also working in a building and architectural firm. And in October of 2010, Greg and Joanna, they moved once again, this time into 44 Cannons Road. And this was in the suburb of Clifton. Joanna was known as happy, beautiful, successful. She was sensible. She had a really good job as a landscape architect. She didn't really drink to like in excess. She didn't do drugs. She had a supportive family and she had a steady relationship with Greg. Life was looking really good for Joanna and she honestly, her life was kind of on track in her eyes, you know, like the paths that she wanted to take, she had taken them and she was really happy, happy with her life. Now on the weekend of 17th, December, 2010, Joanna and Greg had been together for around two years at this point. And Greg wanted to go away. Well, he had plans to go away that weekend to the town of Sheffield to visit his family for that weekend. I'm not sure why Joanna didn't go with him. Maybe it was just meant to be, you know, a family thing, but it was a Friday night on the 17th and Greg, you know, had already left. And after work that Friday, Joanna decided to go and have some drinks with her work colleagues. She was telling her workmates, you know, at this pub, she was like, I'm so bummed. Like I'm bummed that Greg has gone. And it was her first time being alone in this apartment. And she really wasn't looking forward to being alone that whole weekend because it was her first time and she was really going to miss Greg. And this was like one of the first times she wasn't looking forward to the weekend. 
So she left the pub with her colleagues at around 8 p.m. And the pub was kind of close to her home. So she was like, I'm just going to walk home. And she wanted to stop by a few stores on the way home to run a couple errands and to pick up, you know, things to eat. So on the way home, uh, surveillance footage picked her up going into a supermarket. She goes into the supermarket. She comes out. She doesn't buy anything. Then at 8.30, she calls her friend Rebecca and she's talking about like meeting up on Christmas Eve to hang out. Then around 8.40 p.m., she goes into an uh, Tesco Express where she buys a pizza. And it was like a pre-made like pizza that you have to like heat up yourself, but it didn't look like a frozen one. It looked like a fresh kind of pizza that you just like cook at home. She then went to a liquor store called Bargain Booze and she buys like two bottles of cider and then she heads on home. So then now on Sunday, it is the 19th of December, Greg has now returned home to to the flat that he shares with Joanna. And when he comes home, he can tell that the cat looks like, like starving. The cat looks like it's really hungry. And he couldn't find Joanna. Like there was no sign of her in the apartment anywhere. Now, while he was away for the weekend, he was actually trying to contact Joanna um, via mobile, but Joanna wasn't answering. So now when he got home, he's like, okay, let me bring her again. And the thing is, I'm guessing, I don't, I don't think he contacted her like that much to the point where he was worried. He probably just tried like calling her a couple of times and she didn't return his call and she, he wasn't worried. So now that he's back at the apartment, he tries to call her again. And so he rings her mobile phone again, but this time he can hear it ringing in the apartment. So he goes looking for it and he finds it in her coat pocket, uh, in her jacket, but the jacket was still hanging up in the, like on the coat rack. So then he looks around and he finds her purse her glasses and her keys. So now, you know, he waits for her and then around 12 a.m. that night, so Sunday night, he is like, okay, no, he's really concerned. So he calls her parents and he's like, have you seen Joanna? Like, have you heard from her? And they then tell him like, no, we haven't seen Joanna. Like, why? What's wrong? And then he calls the police and reports her missing. So the police immediately come. The investigation began immediately because she had been missing now for two days at this point because Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and that was the first time she was reported missing. So they went looking for her straight away. They come to the apartment and they find the pizza, um, like the pizza that she had bought, they find the receipt of it. But weirdly enough, the pizza packaging was not found. The remnants of the pizza were not found, suggesting that she never ate it. So that was really strange to the police, like number one already, suggesting that, okay, she came home. Like how would she have brought the receipt home without bringing the pizza home, right? Like unless she ate the pizza on the way home, but that probably wasn't the case because the pizza needed to be heated and kind of like cooked and stuff, you know, like the cheese and stuff like that. There wasn't even like a plate with leftovers or anything like that on it. And now this is weird because both bottles of the cider that she had brought home were recovered, but one of them was like part, like partially drunk from, drinking from. One of them was half drank. That's not even English. One of them was a little bit opened. Oh my God. One of them had a few sips taken out of it and then the other one was unopened. And there were neither signs of forced entry or, you know, a disturbance that had taken place. And investigators then go and they look at Greg's like mobile phone and laptop and stuff like that. And then there was nothing like fishy, nothing, nothing was found. So now at this point, police are so confused. So then they end up going on the news and they make a plea holding up this pizza box. They're having a media interview and they hold this pizza box up and they say, okay, guys, you know, like, has anyone, you know, seen a woman who purchased this pizza? If you can please come forward with some information, like we really would like to talk. And they also asked, you know, if anyone, it's, and it sounds weird, but it is a big clue. They said, you know, if you've seen this pizza box, like this specific one, because they even knew like the flavor that she had gotten. And they said, you know, this one with the tomatoes and the basil on it or whatever. And if you see this pizza box, like in the trash or something, like, let us know, please, please come forward with it. Cause we'd like to have this information. So December 21st and no further clues like were presented or, you know, brought for brought forward to the police and they were kind of like at a dead end already. It seemed like. So Joanna's parents, Teresa and David, they make like a desperate plea to the public, like, please someone come forward. 
during this plea, they were just voicing their disbelief as to what could have happened to their daughter. Like, it's really sad. They were just so emotional, so distraught. They even, you know, called out for Joanna. Like, if, you know, you're watching this, please, you know, come forward. Let us know that you're okay. Let us know that nothing has happened to you. Like, we love you and we just want you home. And Joanna's brother, uh, and Greg were also present during this media interview. Greg and Joanna's friends also set up like a website looking for, you know, clues and information relating to Joanna's disappearance. And then they also reached out on social media, like someone please come forward. Like it was a big search. Greg, her boyfriend, was desperate for Joanna to return home. He made multiple pleas. He was really sad. He made a statement saying, you know, she was my future. This was going to be our first Christmas together. You know, I was going to spend it with her family, which is a big deal for a boyfriend. We were both really happy in our jobs. We worked together and that's how we met. And I mean, they were together for two years at this point, but I think what he meant by it was our first Christmas together. I think they were going to spend it together as a couple. And I know that might sound weird to some people, but some couples, like they don't actually, like they go back Like Joanna would go back with her family for Christmas and then Greg would go back with his family for Christmas. I'm guessing that's what used to happen. So this Christmas was their plans to actually spend it together for the first time and, you know, with each other's families as a couple, which is just so sad. So at this point, the search for Joanna continued. Now, by December 23rd, Joanna's family and Greg were all becoming really like they were freaking out. Joanna had been missing for six days at this point and they were starting to believe like, okay, maybe the worst has happened to Joanna. Like they couldn't, they couldn't really stay positive at this point because it's been, you know, nearly a week without her contacting them, you know, without anyone coming forward with any valuable information. Joanna's father even made a statement saying he believes that maybe Joanna was abducted, you know, from her apartment when she returned home that night. Police also believed like, okay, maybe an abduction was possible and not only an abduction, but maybe, maybe an abduction by someone she actually knew. Hence, you know, no signs of a forced entry. So then now it's Christmas day, 25th of December, 2010, Joanna's family and Greg, their worst fear came to life. A couple walking their dog out in Longwood Lane, which was around four miles away from Joanna's flat. As they were walking their dog, they discovered a body that was fully clothed and left on the side of this wall. The body was covered in snow and it looked like an attempt to throw this body over the wall had been made, but it didn't it didn't make it over the wall. It just it just fell back down. Now over the wall was a quarry. So if the body was thrown over, it possibly would have never ever been found. By December 26th, the body was finally identified to be that of Joanna Yates. The post-mortem examination also began that same day, but it there was a delay in the results because the body was so frozen because it had been left there for who knows how long. So on December 28th, the, you know, results were finally released and the cause of Joanna's death was determined to be manual strangulation. It had shown that her neck had been compressed and the way that it was done would have been done manually, meaning not with an object, it would have been with someone's hands. Now there was no evidence that Joanna had been sexually assaulted. She was fully clothed. However, she wasn't wearing a jacket and she had one sock missing. And this sock was like a long gray ski sock and it was used in like, like it was shown to try and locate like what happened to her and if anyone had seen this other sock. It wasn't found in her flat or even anywhere near the body. So like, did the person who did this take it as a trophy? Like, he just took one of her socks. So Greg and the Yates family, they actually wanted to visit the site where Joanna was, Joanna was found on the 27th of December. But David Yates, the father of Joanna, says that the family had been told to prepare for the worst because of just the way everything looked. But he did express relief that he he was relieved that his daughter's body was finally found. Another hard part, I think, for the family was that funeral arrangements were also delayed because they needed to investigate. 
the state was holding the body. The pathologist only consented to the release of the body like a month later in January, on January 21st, 2011. Greg, as well as her brother Chris and family and friends, they all laid bouquets of flowers at the site where Joanna's body was discovered. They also put a picture of her on her graduation day at that site because that was something she was very proud of. Now, obviously, this missing persons investigation turned into a murder investigation and this became one of the largest investigations that ever took place in the Bristol area. The investigation was called Operation Braid and it involved over 80 detectives and civilian staff under um, Chief Phil Jones and he was actually a senior officer with the Major Crimes Investigation Unit. He urged the public to come forward with any information they would have had about the killer, like anything, just, just come forward with anything, especially potential witnesses who were in the vicinity of Longwood Lane where her body was found around that week. I think the problem is because it was snowing, like even if her body was there, maybe no one would have seen it if it was like a heavy snow day or something like that. But they also knew that they were looking for the driver of a light colored four by four vehicle. Chief Jones said that the police had been inundated with calls, like thousands of calls and hundreds of tips, and they were exhausting every leads they could. They also had over a hundred hours of CCTV footage to go through, along with like 300 tons of rubbish that they collected from Joanna's flat. So they were looking everywhere. They were watching, like imagine watching 300 hours, oh sorry, 100 hours of CCTV footage. Like that would take even more time to watch. Crime Stoppers even offered a $10,000 reward leading to the arrest and conviction of her murderer. And the Sun newspaper, I think they offered like 50,000 pounds. Police were informing people, you know, lock your doors, lock your homes really well. And they were advising women not to walk, you know, in the dark by themselves. And it was just such a, like, they don't tell men to do that. You know, it's such a freaking annoying thing. And Joanna's father said, I fear that whoever is responsible was probably not going to hand themselves in, but I really hope the police, you know, all the work that they're doing, I hope that this leads somewhere and I hope that this leads into capturing her killer. So now the investigation begins into, you know, the last whereabouts of Joanna. And a young woman who was actually at a party at like a nearby neighboring house near Joanna's flat. She stated that she heard a woman scream at around 9.30 p.m. the night that Joanna went missing. And the screams were coming from the direction of Joanna's flat, which is important because nine o'clock is exactly, you know, around the time that Joanna would have been returning home. Like it actually would have been the exact time that Joanna would have walked through her front door and this woman would not have known that, you know. Another neighbor in Joanna's flat also claims that they heard a woman scream, help me, at around that same time. Although he could not actually like provide an exact time for the detectives to go off of. Officers even removed the door to Joanna's flat to check for like fibers and further evidence like behind the door. Like clothing fibers and hair fibers, things like that, that could have been stuck behind the door or in the hinges or something like that. Because this was giving the indication that perhaps the perpetrator was already in Joanna's flat when she came home and then attacked her. So maybe he was hiding behind the door and then as soon as she walked in, he ambushed her. So following this, multiple appeals were made by the police and the family to find the person that did this to Joanna. Like, I know the police had some evidence, but it seemed like they were more so going off of like the public's help. Like, hey, can you help us? Like, help us find the guy that did this. And eventually they got someone. Christopher Jeffries was a 65 year old retired school English teacher. And he taught this school. It was like a, a local private school. It was in the area in Clifton. And he was really, really well known in the community. Christopher was actually Joanna and Greg's landlord and he lived in the flat above them and he was pretty active in the community. He helped out with election campaigns and things like that and he was also heavily involved in the neighborhood watch in the community. He was kind of known as like an oddball in the community. Like they would make claims like, oh, he dyed his hair blue and I'm like, I don't know how that makes him odd but I guess if it's like a conservative town, that's what they say. And former students of his would describe him as unconventional, but he was very inspiring. Now, Christopher was arrested 
immediately. This was mainly because he made claims to neighbors telling them that he saw three people enter Joanna's flat around 9 p.m. the night she went missing. And neighbors went and told people that Christopher was telling them, you know, that he had seen Joanna. But then Christopher, he clarifies like, I never said I saw Joanna. I just said I saw three people the night that she, you know, went missing. And if this was true, this would have made him, you know, the last person to have seen Joanna alive the night she went missing. And because of this, this ultimately shown suspicion on him. It also came out that this man, he helped Greg, her boyfriend, fix his car, like, on the 17th or the day before the 17th. So he would have been aware that Joanna would have been alone that weekend because Greg would have told him like, you know, I'm going out of town. And some people took this as, okay, well, there's his opportunity to do something suspicious to Joanna. But Christopher Jeffries, he did not murder Joanna. After several in-depth interviews, searching his flat, like the flat's Around him, forensic searches of his possessions, his whereabouts, police ruled him out as a suspect. He was released on January 1st, 2011. Um, I think he spent two days in prison. He, he was released on bail. But the accusations made on Christopher led to several defamatory reports being made about him, published about him in the local newspapers, and it just really affected his life. There was a dead girl and they were claiming that he was the one that killed her. He was the one that had something to, something to do with her. They painted him out to be this really creepy like landlord who like stalked her or was obsessed with her, something like that. He ended up suing eight newspapers and um, got like $50,000 in damages. And this was because the court determined that, you know, his uh, reputation was being ruined. He was also later issued an apology by the police for the distress that it caused him during this investigation. And I'm not sure if the police like specifically defamed him or if it was more so the media, but it was good that the police, you know, apologized to him. Like I think it was a public apology, but he was like a well-known teacher. And just to have that label on him now, he will forever be sort of known as that. Like some of the pictures they would put of him in the newspaper were like a mockery of him and his career essentially. So let's talk about another neighbor and someone who lived well, duh, it's her neighbor, so live next to her. His name was Vincent Tabak. He was a 32-year-old Dutch national, and he was working in Bristol at the time as an engineer. He lived directly next door, in the flat next door to Joanna and Greg, and he lived with his girlfriend, Tanya. And police actually went and knocked on Vincent's door around 4 a.m. the morning that Greg reported Joanna missing. Vincent was asked if he knew or heard anything about Joanna's disappearance and he responded that he didn't. Following that, Vincent was ruled out. Now, the reason why he even drew any attention back to himself after he was already ruled out was because he went to the police and he told them, you know, that Christopher Jeffries guy, the landlord who lives upstairs, he, the night that Joanna went missing, he moved his car. And I think the reason why that was like suspicious was, oh, well, did he move his car? Did he have Joanna in the car when he moved it? Like he was trying, well, he told the police that, you know, this looked suspicious. So the police investigated this and this was determined to be a lie. And after Christopher was, you know, subsequently released, now Vincent is in the crosshairs of the police and they're like, okay, now we got to focus on this guy. Like, why would he lie about that? So you see, Vincent had made a huge mistake spotting, you know, a little opportunity to frame Christopher, which is exactly what he was trying to do. He contacted police and was like, you know, Christopher was in and out of his car on the night of Joanna's um, disappearance. And his behavior seemed suspicious to the police because when Vincent was being questioned and when he talked about it, he was overly interested in the forensic evidence of like, what did they find? You know, what, what are they looking for? Things like that. Good work because now you have, you know, drawn attention to yourself. So, you know, obviously the police had done routine questions on him, things like that, which he had already answered. So now they ask him, okay, hey, can you provide some DNA just to rule you out? And when they ask him this, he's like, oh, yeah, but you know what? Maybe I have been inside Joanna's apartment. Like maybe I just, you know, went inside to say hello one time. I don't really remember, but maybe I have been inside. He previously said, not never stepped foot in Joanna's apartment before. Like I don't even know them. Never, like never been inside before. So now when he's being asked for DNA, maybe he's like, 
if they do find my DNA in there, I got to tell them like, yeah, 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 I've been in there. That's why my DNA was in there. Then he also switched up like his story about where he was that night and things like that. So now his story started changing. He's sweating. So on January 20th, he was arrested by police, even though he initially basically was refusing to cooperate. And he was answering most questions that the police would now ask him with no comment. Whereas before, he was answering all the questions willingly. The evidence at this point now stacking up against him was becoming overwhelming. However, police eventually got the DNA evidence that they finally needed. And that was DNA evidence that was found on Joanna's body. Now, Vincent, when he was confronted with this, he tried to blame the forensic lab saying, you know, they had mistakenly, you know, done something or sort of framed him. You know, the lab was not secure and people can just go in there and, you know, plant evidence. And he even suggested that the scientist like conducting the investigation was trying to frame him. So on January 22nd, days after being questioned on Joanna's murder, Vincent was finally arrested. On May 5th, 2011, Vincent confessed to killing Joanna, but he did not conf uh, confess to murder. He said it was manslaughter. His plea of manslaughter was rejected and it was determined that he would be facing murder charges on October 2011. Now, when he was in trial, still kept saying manslaughter, manslaughter, didn't mean to, until the very last moment, the very last moment when he was already in the witness stand is when he changed everything. He finally offered his version of events, and prior to this, he wasn't, wasn't willing to do that. So this is what Vincent claims happened on that night. He claims Joanna invited him into her apartment and like made flirty remarks towards him, flirting with him. And she's, and he says that they were chatting in the kitchen and that's when she beha be began behaving that way. So that's what, that behavior is what encouraged him to make a pass at her. So he tried to kiss her or something like that. And Joanna screamed and to stop her screaming, he grabbed her throat. He gripped it with his right hand and then he put his left hand over her mouth and he said he did this you know to stop her screaming but after only 20 seconds or so is when she just slumped to the ground and was unconscious now that seems like a very very simple way to kill someone and very quick the police and prosecution were like no 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 there's huge holes in vincent's story police think this was actually a sex attack and Vincent like got his thrills from strangling his next door neighbor, like someone that was so close to him. They suggested that Vincent could have possibly even been spying on Joanna for a while and finally, you know, found his opportunity to find a reason or an excuse to knock on her door. They don't believe that he was spontaneously invited in. Just happened to be the night that Greg was away. Why would you do that? They think that the attack may have started in the hallway, which is why it seemed like a chaotic scene when they came to investigate at first. It continued in the bedroom because one of Joanna's earrings was found like embedded in the duvet. And they also think something may have happened after because they believed Vincent carried Joanna's body back to his own flat. According to the evidence, they believe that there is a delay of more than an hour before Vincent puts Joanna's car in the back of his car in his trunk. Because he drove it away and then he bought beer and chips like on his um, on his way. He even texted his girlfriend like after the murder. And he was like, I'm so bored. What are you doing? Like just texting her like nothing happened. And finally, the autopsy results show way more than what they believed that Vincent was revealing to the police. So it was revealed that Joanna suffered 43 injuries including wounds to her face, her throat, and her arms. So how did you just strangle her for 20 seconds? It doesn't make any sense. Though her jeans seemed to have been like not tampered with, her t-shirt had been pulled up, um, you know, above her breast and her right breast was exposed. I'm not sure if she had her bra on or not. I'm guessing she would have if she came from work. A sample, this is so sick, of Vincent's DNA was found on her chest, but they haven't, like, they couldn't conclude what that sample was from. Like, did he lick her? Did he, like, like, what was this DNA? On? Like, anyway, it's gross. Samples found behind the knees of her jeans indicated that maybe she was, that's how she was being held while she was being dragged. And the fibers that they found matched Vincent's coat and his car fibers. Blood stains were even found on that 
wall overlooking the quarry indicating that they had, you know, he had tried to throw throw her body over, but it did, he didn't make it, which I don't get why he didn't keep attempting to do it because maybe he panicked. He like did it just once and then he's like, just left her body there. In the days following Joanna's death, he had already, I mean, he had also made like Google searches relating to like length, length of time it takes a body to decompose and the dates of like rubbish collection um, trucks around the area. The bottom line is that no one apart from Vincent can actually say what happened that night, but the version of events that he's giving the police is just, it's too sketchy. So now he was taken to trial and during the trial, it was revealed that Vincent, for his job, he had to travel to the US back and forth to the UK and stuff like that, like travel all around the UK, travel to the US as part of his job. During these business trips, he had contacted a sex worker several times by phone and arranged meetups. He also viewed violent on the internet, which depicted women being like controlled by men in really aggressive ways, held by the neck, choked. And look, a lot of porn nowadays anyways, like if you look at it, like even if it's not like a violent like category, some of the, how do I say this without being, some of these sex acts, especially oral sex is very, very aggressive in these. And I feel like, you know, People are into it. Men like it. Women like it. It's a thing, right? But if you're looking up more violent than that, like it's already kind of aggressive, you know, like rough sex, things like that. But he was looking up like intense violent where women were like crying and like being really, really like it looked real, you know, like that's what he was into. The police on his computer also found like a picture of a woman or a video of a woman and engaging in these sex acts, but she looked identical to Joanna, like very, very close in looks. And in one scene of this video, this woman who looks like Joanna, she pulls up this top and she's like showing her boobs and stuff like that. And she's wearing this pink top. The night that Joanna went missing, the, the same clothes that she was found in, she was wearing a very similar pink top. And I'm like, what happened? Like you saw Joanna, you were freaking looking through your people. And then you remembered this video that you saw and you were just like, I have to do it now. Like, it's just so weird that it's so weird, so gross. So throughout the investigation, throughout the trial, Vincent just kept on maintaining, like, I don't know how Joanna got all those injuries to her body. All I did was, you know, choke her out with, you know, trying to silence her. I didn't do anything else. He he maintained, you know, must have happened some some other way. He said it was purely an accident what happened to Joanna. The prosecution, on the other hand, was like, no. Nah, Vincent entered Joanna's flat that night to, with this intention to kill her. It was not an accident and her injuries show that sufficient force had been used on Joanna's neck. In other words, like when he was choking her out, he could have stopped, but he didn't. Like it wouldn't have taken 20 seconds to kill her. He could have, he had plenty of time to stop, but he chose not to. Her neck was held long and hard enough to kill her. And the um, forensic uh, experts say that there would have been a violent struggle from Joanna trying to fight for herself and that death was not instantaneous. He used extreme force and there was no sign of a ligature and that he could have had time to let go, but he just didn't. They also claim that at the time that this was happening, Vincent would have known that Joanna was in pain, struggling to breathe. And despite that, Vincent chose to continue squeezing her neck to the point where he killed her. Vincent's defense was that killing her was not sexually motivated and he had no reason to do so. He stated that she, you know, made this flirty comment and that's why, and then she invited him into her flat and that's why he went in. They were supposed to have a drink and he tried to kiss her and then she screamed. And then to stop her screaming and to draw attention, that's when he used his hands to, you know, hold her neck and accidentally killed her. The weird thing is there was no sign of sexual assault, but I think Sexual assault is not just limited to your genitals, right? Like, I feel like he definitely got off on something for sure. I feel like he he assaulted her in his own sick ways. Maybe he even wanted to go further, but the whole thing just escalated way too quickly. Maybe he didn't know when Greg was coming back and he had to get Joanna out of the apartment and now she's dead and he doesn't know what to do with her. The jury deliberated for three days and then found Vincent to back guilty on 28th October 2011. Vincent was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 20 years. And during the trial, the, the jury was actually not pre presented with the evidence that they found of him watching like the violent things like that. Vincent had actually been watching all of this leading up to the murder. 
And these details actually were released to the public after the trial was over. And then after the trial, what came out further was that Vincent had like over a hundred images and videos of child on his computer. He was then charged and sentenced to a further 10 months in prison. 10 months? That's it? That's it? But, I mean, it was on top of, you know, a life sentence. So he was truly just a sick, sick human being. He's not a human being. So David and Teresa, Joanna's parents, actually didn't attend court on the day the verdict was being read because they just found it too difficult to endure. They did release a statement afterwards, which I'll read. They said, the best we can hope for him, Vincent, is that he spends the rest of his life incarcerated, where his life is a living hell, being the recipient of all evils, deprivations, and degradations that his situation can provide. We will never get over our loss, how she was murdered, and the total lack of respect with which her body was treated. We so miss her happy voice and seeing her living her life to the fullest. It's just, I can't imagine these parents, how they, how they even live after something like this happens. Joanna was finally buried on 17th February, 2011, and over 300 people attended her funeral. Greg, Joanna's boyfriend, started a charity website to help the families um, of missing people. Joanna's friends and family also planted a memorial garden at Sir Harold Hillier Gardens, where she worked as a student. And that's the end of today's case, guys. Another life taken away by a person who should never have even had the title of being called a human being. I'm glad that Christopher Jeffries, that landlord, that he got an apology because I can't imagine how panicked he even would have been being accused of a crime like this, like that he didn't, that he wasn't involved in at all, that he didn't commit. Being, you know, a prestigious teacher and a member of this, of the community and then being accused of something like that, like it must have really, really been hard for me. Even, even if it was for a short period of time, the media just rolls with it, you know, and people now have made up their minds after hearing what they read on the news. Crazy that the killer was her next door neighbor, Vincent. I mean, how long was he interested in Joanna? How long was he planning on doing something to her? And did he know Greg was going to be out of town? Like, or was it just the perfect timing? What do these guys think? Like, oh, I'll just kill her, my neighbor. No one will ever like suspect it's me. There's like, no one will find out. I will never understand the human mind. Like we are our own worst enemies. Anyway, let me know your thoughts on today's case, guys. I hope you enjoyed today's video and I will see you in the next one. Besitos. Bye.